Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today's podcast is top secret. I'm fixing my marriage. Don't tell my husband. My guest, Stephanie, was disappointed and unhappy in her marriage and exhausted by the constant tension. And then she found out there was another woman. Physical intimacy had been few and far between before that. Then she made a discovery that gave her hope that she could save her marriage and make it worth saving. But when she started changing the way she interacted with her husband, he reacted with anger and frustration. But today she feels light and free and her 25 year marriage feels like a gift that keeps getting better. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. And then I'll be giving out the worst relationship advice of the week award, which is so cringy and unpleasant. It would just make everyone avoid you if you followed it. All that is coming up. But first, let's get to the top secret part where I'm fixing my marriage and don't tell my husband. Should you ever come clean about what you're doing behind his back to make your marriage last? Well, I got a great note from a student named Teresa who had just read The Empowered Wife and she really got that the marriage problems that she'd been griping about and wanting her husband to change for years were mostly things that she had been complicating herself. She wanted to do the experiments in the book without having her husband see it and ask her about it. So she quickly made a book cover to hide the title. And mostly she was afraid he would read it and see where she was going wrong. And he would say, I told you so, or see what you're like. And that's pretty unlikely in my experience. As you begin to implement the intimacy skills, husbands get happy and they get chivalrous, generous, grateful, not vindictive and obnoxious. But there was a problem. Teresa wanted to join the Ridiculously Happy Wife program to get all four pillars of the connection framework. And she wondered how she could make that purchase and get help with the kids while she was joining the calls without letting the cat out of the bag about what she was doing. Of course, it involves using one of the intimacy skills, which I'll show you in a moment. But why is all this so hush-hush to begin with? I mean, why do we do this so secretly anyway? For one thing, talking about practicing the six intimacy skills is not as powerful as actually using them. And to paraphrase Catherine Aird, since I can't be a good example, I'm just going to have to be a horrible warning here. When I was first discovering the intimacy skills, I decided to talk to my husband about the changes that I was thinking and maybe making around the way I interact with him instead of actually making a change to the way I interact with him. And I would say things like, Casey says she tries never to criticize her husband no matter how much he seems to deserve it. And I don't think that's right. Do you? And my peace-loving husband would stand at attention and say, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I had him well-trained. And as you already know, this was not progress towards intimacy, passion, and peace in my marriage. All I did was steamroll him into agreeing that I should continue to steamroll him, which embarrassingly, I did for a while longer. It wasn't until I stopped talking to him about how I was interacting with him that I started to see some real improvement in myself and therefore in us. I relied heavily on conversations with other supportive wives, which turned out to be critical to my success. Another benefit to practicing intimacy skills and secrecy is that the more privacy you have, the more safety you'll have to experiment, even if you flop. Even though Teresa's husband would probably not say, I told you so, as she started to clean up her side of the street in their relationship, She noticed that there is a nice safety that comes with embarking on these experiments without your man having any expectations. After all, you're just learning and it's nice to not have too much pressure. Although my husband didn't know much about what I was doing when I first started practicing the six intimacy skills. He knows everything now because I 
talk about it like on TV frequently. And because I'm not perfect, there are times when my husband will suggest that there's a good book that I really should read. And he means the one that I wrote about how to be respectful in marriages. And you might think that's pretty funny, but I usually don't find it that amusing. So if your husband never knows you're doing anything different, then he can't complain that you're not doing the things in the book right when you get mad and maybe snap at him for putting the smart thermostat back to factory settings instead of just turning off the heater like I asked. Whew. All of that is true. And yet, yet, is it really critical that your husband never ever find out what you're doing when you start practicing the six intimacy skills? I mean, will it ruin your chances of becoming desired, cherished, and adored if he finds out the details? Definitely not. I even know of husbands who bought and read one of my books before giving it to their wife. But that doesn't stand between them and getting to the part where they're so physically affectionate that their kids are complaining about it. Unless there's a pressing reason to bring it up, you might as well enjoy the advantages of keeping it private, especially at first. Eventually, husbands find out what you're doing, and typically they smile. Sometimes they even acknowledge that you've been working really hard. That always feels so good. So what should you do if you want the privacy, but you also want to go further than just reading a book like Teresa and you need your husband's buy-in? Well, you could express a desire in a way that inspires him and let him ask questions from there. You could use the formula for expressing desires in a way that inspires him by saying, I would love, and then the final outcome, right? So I would love to join a program to learn how to be a ridiculously happy wife. Or you could even say, I would love to join a program to learn how to be a more respectful wife. That's how you seem to your husband when you stop being too helpful and get really happy is more respectful. And I often hear women report that that was all they had to say. And that even though money was tight, he made it happen. Or even though he said he was leaving, he supported her in signing up. Sure, he might ask a question about it, but get this. Most husbands don't. From what I hear, the headline for them is, I could make my wife happy if she gets to join this program. And that's what they walk away with. And that's what they want. Most husbands are smart enough to catch on that what you're wanting is going to benefit him too. And if you want to say more, you always can. You're the expert on your own life. But in my experience, less is definitely more. Over and over again, we get emails like this one that came recently from a woman in Portland. I'm ready to take you up on your offer to join your online group. I did what you said in telling my husband very little about it, and it worked. Enough said. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest, Stephanie, was disappointed and unhappy in her marriage and exhausted by the constant tension. And then she found out there was another woman. Physical intimacy had been few and far between before that. But then she made a discovery that gave her hope that she could save her marriage and make it worth saving. But when she started changing the way she interacted with her husband, he reacted with anger. Today, she feels light and free, and her 25-year marriage feels like a gift that keeps getting better. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. Stephanie, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to share your story. Thank you, Laura. It's great to be here. So let's start with the battle days. What were things like in your marriage? 
Um, so as you said in the introduction, I've been married 25 years. We have four grown kids. Um, so we're now empty nesters. And we have moved several times for my husband jobs over the year. We've taken many vacations. And, and I can safely say that he is the breadwinner. Um, I work, but our lifestyle is definitely a gift that he gave. And I use the word gift now because all that I've learned through Laura Doyle has shown me that it truly is a gift. And back in the battle days, even a year ago, I felt that I had it harder because I was the mom and I worked full time and we have pets and, you know, the house and, and I didn't look at it any other way. So I need to start with that because I never considered that my words or lack of words would cause the harm that I did in my marriage, if that makes sense. And I, I thought that life just happened. I mean, we raised beautiful children, we had beautiful homes, but it was a fraud, right? Like behind closed doors, I was controlling. I was dismissive. I was a bad listener. And I just, I wasn't giving him what I thought I, I never gave him what I thought I needed to give him because I didn't think about it this way. I kept thinking about, what are you giving me? Like, what about me? I cleaned the kitchen before I left for work at 6 a.m. What about me? So at the end of September of 2020, you know, in the height of COVID, um, my husband was commuting back and forth for his job between uh, California and Utah. And on a typical Saturday when we, oh, let me back up. So because it's COVID, he drove back and forth, right? Because you know, one really was flying. Did I consider that a sacrifice? No. I was just like, whatever, this is what he's going to do. Oh, I'm so bad. But anyway, so on this typical Saturday that we weren't together, I always would FaceTime him in the morning. Hi, how are you? What's going on? And I noticed that he was off, but that was something that was kind of on a regular basis for him. Like he was off on a regular basis. And I, I just didn't think, I just didn't think about it. Partway through the conversation, he literally said to me, I need to separate. I need space. And I'm like, wait, what? Like you're already separated. You don't live with me full time. I'm like, what are you, what? He's like, I can't talk to you for a while. I really need a break. I'm not happy. Like you can't, he's like, you can't tell me you're happy. This is not working. You know, all those lines mixed together. Well, of course I freaked out. Right. Yes. Um, And I didn't understand and I couldn't comprehend because here I am like in our home during COVID by myself working like the whole thing. And he's like, I need a break. I'm like, you already have one. I was in such shock that I think at that moment, I didn't know what to say. So you and I, must've been very hurtful also. Oh, it was, it, I don't even know if I was at that part yet. I think shock, right? You start with shock. And I kept thinking, how do you, you're doing this to me? Yeah. You know, like it wasn't about us but you're doing this to me. And, you know, what's that line, Lori? Like people say, oh, I built this life with my husband. In that moment, we built our life with paper and Elmer's glue and it was crumbling to the ground because it it just blew up. It was like you lit a match and it was just like a wildfire, right? It just... Wow. And he was so angry. You could see it in his face and he was silent and he, he wouldn't look me in the eye. He would not look me in the eye because it was FaceTime. It was like, there was nothing there. And I just, I, I think I was just like, como to, I just laid there. And I called him back a couple hours later and I was like, I don't, I was crying and I was like begging, pleading. Ah, oh, so bad. I'm like, I don't understand. You're my person. How, how, how am I supposed to understand how to fix this? If you're my person that I go to, who am I going to tell? Who's going to listen to me? Mm. And he said, look, I know this is hurting you. He said, but I need to do this and I need time and I can't talk to you. 
I need a break. Wow. What happened then was, you know, I just kind of, like any woman, you curl in a ball, you lay on the floor, you sob a lot, and you do nothing. And of course, the next day you wake up and you're like, okay, well, Google's my friend. So let's start. And I have to tell you that that physically debilitating feeling, you know, is, is it hurts, right? It hurts. So you're Googling as fast as you can to find anything to get rid of that pain. And what's out there is kind of scary. It's really kind of scary. Like the different sites that came up, it was just... Oh, it was creepy. It was scary. It was gross. And blah. like, what did you find? What- like I found like this one was, I couldn't, I don't, you know, by a man who said, just do this. Or, you know, it was one was, um, how to, how to, you know, how to ask for forgiveness, but it wasn't like the way, even the way I was brought up to ask for forgiveness. It was, you need to, you need to go in there naked or, or it was just so, it was so disgusting. It just, it was just bad, but you don't know what you don't know. And so you're like, okay, you're, I'm going to give my email to everybody. Cause I, I mean, something has to work. Right. Yes. And I did this for hours. Well, finally I took a break and you go on, you know, I went on social media and sometimes social media can, you know, tell you what you need to know. And there she was, there she was in all her glory, Laurel Doyle. You just need the six steps. And I was like, wait, what, what are those six? What's the pathway? What, what is this? Well, I need to know what this was. And I did not understand what the roadmap was. What's a roadmap? And I'm like, I can do six things. That's easy. It's under 10. How? So I must have signed up to find out what the roadmap is like 10 times in one day because oh. I couldn't get it back fat. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, like it just. So I went on your website and I started reading all these blog posts. Um, I, uh, up until then, I, I had listened to podcasts, but I was like, I didn't know if I really should. And I, as I was reading the different blog posts, I was like, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Who's going to help me? Oh my God. This is going to help me. It doesn't make sense yet. Like it seemed counterintuitive, but okay. I'll, I'll, yes. Why is this? And it was resonating with me. I went on Amazon. I bought my book. I, you know, forget free shipping. I expedited the shipping so I could get it faster. It was, you know, and I started crying because I couldn't take the information in fast enough. But at the same time, I realized that I was purposely sabotaging my husband and my marriage by not seeing what was right in front of me in the mirror and myself. Like I wasn't seeing myself. I, I, I was doing all these things either unintentionally or intentionally. Like in your introduction, I rejected sex. I was like, I'm not into it. I don't want to do it. And I blatantly would do that. And like not even thinking twice about it because I was tired from the kids or my job. It wasn't him, but it didn't matter right? It doesn't matter. So the next day I had to go back to work because it was the weekend was over and it was Monday. And I was so thankful for masks because nobody could see me. Right. And I was, I just, the swollen eyes, the no makeup, the, I looked horrible. Mm. And I remember, you know, I'm a school teacher. So there was a student who said to me, you, you look really, are you okay? you look like you've been crying. And I remember looking down at his beautiful face and I'm like, no, just tired. Like you have to lie. I'm not going to, but wow, he just saw it. It was just right there. It was right there. So I came home and the book came. I mean, expedited shipping is expedited shipping. (laughs) And that night I stayed up the entire night and I read it and I highlighted it. And I annotated note it and I got, found a notebook somewhere in my house and I started taking notes on all of it. 
And I just, I, I, oh, this is how to become a member of the Laura Doyle Secret Facebook group. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to be a ridiculously happy housewife and I'm going to go on and I'm going to get everything. So I stayed up and I was reading all the Facebook posts and it, it was overwhelming, right? There's so much information if you don't understand it. So I never posted myself and I just kept reading and I went back to the book and then I started listening to podcast one and I started every day on my drive to work, I would listen to another podcast and I had my first group coaching call the following Monday night. And I, I took shower. I didn't realize that it was going to be like looking at each other, but okay. And there were these beautiful women doing what in the Laura Doyle campus is called check-ins where they were sharing these great moments that they've had or, or a, a Laura Doyle skill, as we call them, that she was successful at. And I was like, I, I got to go back to the book. I must've missed that, you know, cause you're reading so fast. You don't get everything the first time. So after these beautiful women shared their, you know, with smiles, the coach says, I see we have somebody new on the call. Stephanie, welcome. And I pushed my little button so she could hear me speak. And I said, hi. And she said, we, you know, welcome. And she told me that this is a safe place and that she's glad that I'm here. And I've, I found the right place. And she's like, would you like to tell us a little something about yourself? And I'm like, um, okay. My name's Stephanie. I'm in a 25 year marriage and my husband asked to separate and I just start crying, but Mm -hmm. it just starts. And she said, well, we have what's called the hot seat. It's called one-on-one coaching. Would you like for me to coach you today? And we can talk through the first skill, which is you taking good care of yourself, self-care. And I'm like, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew that I was desperate for something and I knew that I felt so alone and so miserable before that moment that I know I needed something, right? And I took the hot seat and I, she coached me and I wanted these women at the end of the coaching call after I like got it all out and she was so great. And then all of a sudden she said, Now we're going to do what's called takeaways. Other women in the group that have listened to your story are now going to say what they've learned. And these women, I wanted them to be my friends. it It was beautiful. And it's so scary when you're an outsider coming into something new, especially as a woman, right? Because we, we want to fit in and we don't want to be judged. Right. Right. And these women were just loving and beautiful. And they, they heard things for themselves from my story. I'm like, how is that even possible? They were gracious. They were kind. And even though their marriage issues may have been different than mine, we all have that same common panic stricken nausea feeling when we don't know what to do and after that hour long phone call or zoom meeting um depending on how you entered the the group i was i felt lighter i felt like okay maybe maybe i can wake up tomorrow maybe i can sleep And I slept that night for the first time in over a week since the bomb had been dropped. Unfortunately, Laura, what I learned next was uh, there was another woman. And I had my suspicions for a very long time, but, you know, I'm, I'm not... I never confronted my husband. I may have been passive aggressive in little comments, but never to never like coerced him or anything. So I started searching for things and I'm not proud of it, but I did. And I found stuff, emails and texts and, you know, she's in the phone log 
And when you start to see that stuff, something happens. You process past behaviors and past conversations and they start making better sense, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Like, I know that I don't, I I didn't want to search or maybe I did back then. I don't know. Now it's not even a question, but I think a lot of it is that searching moment is getting clarification of past behaviors, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, last summer during the height of COVID, being a school teacher, I don't, I don't work in the summer. It's a gift. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, you know, because my husband and I were having issues that I would just go wherever he was and be with him 24-7, follow him, stay in the apartment or the condo or the hotel while he was at work, wait for him to come home, and then start again. So I went wherever he went. Well, that's that's not a good idea. I was just just like this pathetic little thing. Like, what'd you do all day? How's it going? What do you mean? You know, blah, blah. And I mean, he couldn't get out of that condo, apartment, house, whatever, fast enough every day. Like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, who wants to be with that? I mean, my screechy voice, I acted desperate. I acted needy. I sounded whiny. He started going for runs. He's not a runner. He went for runs to talk to the other woman, like whatever he had to do. Oh, for sure. But of course, none of that made sense to me back then, right? So now we're in October of 2020. And I, like I said, I couldn't get enough of the coach calls of the private and I started private coaching. It was worth every penny. It's not even expensive. And Those were miracles in themselves because that's when you can truly dig deep into what I need to do for me. The group coaching calls all day, every day. I I think I did four or five a week and I took notes on all of them. And but what I learned in the private coaching was that my wrongdoings, I had to acknowledge them. And I had to acknowledge that I was controlling and dismissive. And that's hard. It's hard. It's hard to see how wrong you are and not crawl into a hole and hide, right? Yes. In fact, when you say wrongdoings, I mean, at this point, you must be feeling pretty justified. He's the one that's saying he wants a separation. He's the one that had another woman. You were... A uh, dutiful mom and wife for all these twenty five years. What? Where do you even find that? Well, I found it in my private coach because as I sit there and tell her my deepest, darkest secrets, I was mean, I was nasty, I was controlling. I I went through his phone or his email or whatever and found the other woman. She's like, "It's okay. You're you're a mere mortal woman. This is." it's okay. And at the end of those private coaching calls, not only did I feel better about myself, but I could take accountability and know that I could be forgiven. Right. And I, part of Laura Doyle's program is that it is a little counterintuitive, right? Oh yes. You have to start with self-care. And I'm like, what the heck is self-care? You want me to stop my day when I'm obsessing over my husband and light a candle, put on lotion, you want me to do those things? And you're, and you know, yes, yes. And the reason is, and it takes a little while to figure out, maybe a few weeks, that when you provide for yourself, when you go to make that first apology to your husband for something that you want to be accountable for, you can make that apology without fear, without a preconceived notion or expectation. And to give the apology and want nothing in return, there's nothing bigger, I think, as a gift for myself and for that person. So I'm like, okay. So with self-care, I started with little things, smelly lotions, little candles, You know, things that I never thought were important um, that I may have done, but I never like thought of them consciously. And so I thought I start, I being a school teacher, I wrote, I wrote them down every time I did one, I would write it down and I would keep a list. And Laura Doyle tells you to make a list of 20 things, but every day I recorded what I did for self-care. And what I started realizing was 
there may have been an hour a day where I didn't hurt or I didn't think of my husband or I, I wasn't nauseous. And over time, those hours grew, right? And you start realizing that as you have this you know, incredible feeling inside of yourself that you, I'm not as scared. I'm not as scared about putting my clothes on. I wasn't worried. And I wasn't thinking of my husband, but I was thinking of my well being. And it felt really good. And when you recognize the moments of calm through that self care, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Being calm for me was never natural. I was always the woman in the state of frenzy. I had to multitask. I had to do this and do that. But you know, multitasking actually is, um, it's really not good for us, (laughs) to be honest. Let's be honest. And being calm was something I had to teach myself. Um, But I will say, and I know this is jumping ahead, that I am now calm. And I love the person I am. And I love, I love my calm state. And it's so ingrained in me now. It it won't go away. It will never go away. Do I get excited about things? Of course. You know, you get so excited. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. calmness of just being is awesome. So this was like a personality transplant to go from frenzy to calm. Yeah. And this is what, I really just want to pause for a minute because it was so moving. God, tears my eyes when you were talking about being able to be in the space where you are making an amends, asking for forgiveness and wanting nothing in return because you already feel so whole. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, that is absolutely right. So I knew I couldn't apologize to him yet, right? Like, because you, I, I knew, I knew that in order to apologize, I had to feel whole. I had my apologies written. I knew what they were supposed to be, but I also knew that I had to learn more from the Laura Doyle campus and how these skills were making me feel better about me before I could be genuine in that, you know, apology. Such so wisdom. I, so it's, it's, it's well, so nice. yes, mm-hmm. yeah. And so I, you know, I got help from the Facebook community, and I finally, after a few weeks, was able to send a couple of texts to my husband. Just fun, silly little things, no expectation, right? And that's a big, that's a big deal because expectations equal control, and I don't want to control, right? And learning that now, did I sit by the phone? Well, yeah, I'd never done this before. Of yeah. course. <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> You're a mortal woman. Right? Exactly. You're hopeful. But I, yeah. Right. So I would send a fun text and then I would stick it in my drawer, my phone in my drawer, and I would walk away because that's really the I wouldn't, you know, and, and he he actually started um to return them. And I, you know, and from these, when we had our first phone call, I learned the power of my tone. Like with calmness comes a very soft spoken voice, right? And comes the quiet. And what I realized was as I'm using this new tone and this quiet, that it sent this um, unspoken message of how any conversation with me is going to be, whether it's with my friends, my family, but most importantly with my husband. So when we did start talking again, I was soft-spoken. Like I said, I still am today. I initiated this environment with him without even realizing it. Like I had that control right away. Like I was in control of my, my power is my words, right? But you don't realize that. Like you don't realize it when you're first testing the waters. So what also happened was there were no more fights because I was instantly calm. There were no wars. There was no, as we say on the Laura Doyle campus, state of the, you know, state of the union, big, no. There were, he would say things because he's upset, but my reaction was always just to zip my lip and not say anything. And on Laura Doyle, we call that duct tape. And I, that was one skill 
learning how to not speak, that came very easy because I was so scared. Being scared and realizing that I need to stay calm, you just don't say anything, right? You just keep your mouth shut. So he was becoming less angry, if you will, because I wasn't saying anything. Mm. You know, and I wasn't reacting the way that he was very used to yes. me, me doing. He would vent. He could yell. He could say whatever. But I would never wow. respond. And, and wow. it, it, yeah, it started out <laughs> of fear. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> right? Who does that? I it's so hard. I, I think literally it's, and it's, I have to be honest, it started out of fear, but then it became second nature to just not say anything and, and be calm. Then I had the realization, you know, like I said, that I had to write down my self-care. And then I had the realization that I needed to write down my positive interactions with people, anything that made my day better, right? Hmm. And it, it did not have to do with my husband, but it could have to do with my husband. And I realized that on the Laura Doyle campus, this is called wins. And wins are anything, anything. I'm driving in my car and I'm not getting mad about traffic. That's a win because I'm is. laying calm, right? It is. So I kept, yeah. I kept these two logs going every day and it really, really helped me to record, to write these things down. Not and, and I'm an old school person. I like pen and paper. So I, you know, I kept a log every day. Love it. And that way, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing, let's say three to five self cares a day, I knew that it, it, because I wrote it down, I would be like, Oh, I got to add one. I got to add one. Oh. And let me say like in the beginning when I was really sad and, and fearful, I set an alarm on my phone every hour. Nice. My phone would go and I would like do something. Even if it was my go-to is drinking ice water because it just changes how I physically feel. So yeah. Yeah, now we're in the sense. middle of all this, right? We're now, you know, he's starting to respond and, and, and we're going, you know, it, things are starting to happen. And I haven't seen him yet. I haven't physically seen him yet. He's still, I've had maybe two phone calls, maybe a couple texts, but that's about it. But then it's like you get on the roller coaster, you know, because for every positive interaction with my husband, there are two negative. And negative could be as easy as him not contacting me at all mm. because they retreat. They, he doesn't know what to do. And uh, he was confused, right? Mm -hmm. And as much as confused husbands are good in this moment because there's another woman and he wants to separate, it still felt like rejection to me. But he, I had to look at it as he didn't trust me. He didn't trust my new approach to us. He was waiting for the old me to come back. And he had to go through whatever he was going through at his time. He was confused by my word choices because I was using Laura Doyle word choices. Things like he would say something and I would just say, I hear you. Mm. And wow. he'd be like, what? Does that like, I'll be like, well, I, I'm listening to you. I hear you or I trust you or whatever you think. And these are phrases that one, do not come, did not come natural to me to say, but definitely do not come natural for them, for husbands to hear. And in your books and, and it, on the campus, it's constant. Use them, use them, use them, even if you're uncomfortable because they send a very clear tone. And that goes with that calm tone. So I can't, I mean, I just kept doing it. The next thing I had to learn was how, besides self-care, how to make myself feel better. So I had a, one of my private coaching calls. This is probably early November. My coach said, there's something called self-fulfilling prophecies, SFPs. We Every day we look at these as mantras, words of wisdom, affirmations. And she's like, I want you to come up with something about yourself. This is not about your husband. It's about you. So I was like, all right, that kind of makes sense. But I'm not going to believe anything right now that I'm going to come up with for 
myself because there's another woman and I'm controlling and all these things. And, but you know, it was really important. So she and I spent that coaching session working on calls workshop and we're just working through, right. Practicing and coming up with what I should say to myself. I felt ridiculous, you know, saying them, but the flip side was I was telling these stories in my head that are never true. He's doing this with the other woman right now, or he's purposely doing, you know, saying this about me to the other woman. I mean, all these things that you make up in your head because you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So she's like, no, we need to not sabotage myself, not believe these made up stories. Right. And I need to commit to coming up with three to five self-fulfilling prophecies, write them down every day and say them every day. And I could not understand why they had to be about me because I thought I had, it had to be about my husband, but except like self-care, I had to start with me and how to make me feel better. Right. Did I believe these words at first? No, but because I wasn't that person yet, but today I am. What, give us an example. What, what were some of your SFPs? Your self- I am lovable. I am yeah. loving. I am mm. worthy. Mm. And I love my inner smile. That was mm. the biggest one for me was I love my inner smile. Because back then I didn't smile at all. Mm. And now I have an inner smile. And you feel it. Like when you smile to yourself during certain moments of the day. And that's just your inner smile. And I was channeling these by writing them down and saying them every day. And I did, you you don't realize the power of those words that you say to yourself. And because I was able to say those words and write them down every day, we come to Thanksgiving when my husband now is coming home, right? Because it's Thanksgiving, it's a holiday and we have children and family and he's coming home that although I was petrified to see him, I knew between saying those self-fulfilling prophecies, making sure that I did my self-care and staying calm and quiet, that I could be present when he was physically in front of me. That's really the first time that we were really together. And it was hard. I was nervous. I was awkward. Um, I felt like I needed some wine to show up a couple yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I spent much time excusing myself going into the bathroom to <laughs> yeah. Right? To, so to center to get back yes. to Stephanie. Like yes. Just check in yeah. on Stephanie. How are you feeling? Yeah. What what yeah, what do you want? Yeah. So during Thanksgiving, there were many wins. Um, he slept in our bed. Oh. Yep. He I gave my first big apology. What did you apologize for? I apologize for um, my first big one was a year, a year before Christmas, he gave me a very, very expensive gift. And I pulled the ultimate move and was like, this is too expensive. We need to take it back and blah, blah, blah. Did I think about his feelings in that moment? No, that was so disrespectful of me to do that he he gave it out of the love of his heart Mm. so I apologized for that and I knew that he was not ever going to expect me to apologize for that because in his world that's insignificant it's a materialistic thing it's not it's like what you know but what's interesting is that he responded positively he's like wow thanks like it was a big deal he didn't and say that's okay or no big deal. He said, no, sorry. he was just said, thanks. Like, yeah. wow. Like, yeah. thank you. So I think by me doing that, he had this moment and he was like, I'm going to stay for the whole week. And I was like, wow, like that's huge. And I was able to, through coaching, one of the things that we learn is how to listen for heart messages. So when our husbands get very upset and angry and mad and sad, they tend to say things that in the old Stephanie, I would take offense to, and I would 
not rationalize, but the, with the new Stephanie, I was able to hear his, what we call heart message, because through that heart message is, is his way of telling me how he feels. So his heart message during Thanksgiving was that his apartment in California, because he has to have an apartment in California, was his safe place. Mm -hmm. And he was tired of being a paycheck for our lifestyle and never being heard. No one ever listened to him. Mm -hmm. And so I knew these things before, but I never understood them. I never paid attention to them. And so I knew that this is where I needed to start. Like, okay, I need, I need to start with him being able to be heard and to create a safe place for him. And to recognize and acknowledge him for the gift of our lifestyle, like I said in the beginning. Was there still another woman? Yes. Was I still searching for her? Of course I was looking. Of course. Because again, I'm not, I'm still new. I'm only in two months, three months into learning about Laura Doyle. And I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. But thinking and obsessing over the other woman let alone what he would be doing with her when he was with her. It, it didn't serve my growth. And I, I felt the calm coming. December was hard, right? So we come to December and December was hard. And I was working with Laura Doyle's skills, podcasts, blog posts, Facebook groups, so much, as much as I could fit it in, in my day. I did not stop to think my marriage was going to end, but I didn't think at that time it was going to be healed either. I was only thinking about me and how I wanted to be calm, quiet, and and more present. And the person that showed up at work was more calm and more present. Like the skills spill out, right? To our everyday. So then for Christmas, my husband said he was going to come home for about two weeks because it's, again it's the holidays and we have kids and it's just big, huge and stressful. How do I show up? How do I maintain my growth? How do I get in my self-care? Like all these things going through, through and for two weeks. Well, it started by me relinquishing control of the Christmas tree. I always had to pick up the perfect Christmas tree and I had to decorate it like it looked like, well, I don't even know what, and I just <laughs> let it go. And he of course picked out, a Christmas tree, I would never pick out a very tall Charlie Brown looking Christmas tree. And he and my son decorated it. And you know what? It was great. It was ugly and imperfect and awesome at the same Aww. time. Aww. So I, by me doing that, I was like, I can do this. I can let go, right, of that control and not a, worry it, about that. Yeah, it was a demonstration of your own superpowers that you'd been acquiring. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So during that two weeks, we took walks and he started doing things for me, Laura, that in our entire 25 years of marriage, she's never done. For example, I was outside one day cleaning up some stuff from the snow and he drew me a bath. I'm like, who is this man? And <laughs> what? What? Like, he was like, you want to take a walk in the snow? Uh, okay. You, you know, (laughs) it was, it was great. And so of course now I'm really learning that his power and his way of apologizing is through his actions and to forget about some of the bad stuff that he says, because sometimes they say stuff just to say it and we don't have to, like, they don't need us to, to, even acknowledge it, but to focus on his actions. So now we're in January and February. Like I said, I know that the other woman's still out there, but I've never said anything to my husband. I may have made a couple passive aggressive comments, but I've never confronted him. I never coerced him. I never wow. begged him. I never, I never did anything. I just didn't That's think amazing. about it. I That's- didn't think about it. I mean, I really, honestly, I, I, I didn't think of doing that with him because since we were already not together physically a lot because his job is in a different place and we were technically separated, I was like, I can't, 
have a fight with him, I already know that that's not going to work, right? Wow. Yes. But that it's still extraordinary. I think it's just so instinctive to try to insist or demand or beg or plead or something. So that does seem like a really remarkable part of your story that you... Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to say it was intentional, but it just did not occur to me. And I guess jumping ahead or jumping behind, I guess that's a great piece of advice for any woman with a, with a, you know, their husband having an affair is just, I know you can't get it completely out of your mind, but whatever you do, just don't speak to it ever out loud to your husband. That's what the Laura Doyle Facebook group is for. That's what your coach is for. Your girlfriends, anybody but him. So by now I'm like, it's February and I'm learning how to trust myself. Right. And, and trust my husband because he is having, like, there is another woman and I have to learn how to trust that and let go of anything and everything that was hindering my progress. What's interesting is, um, as I look back right now, like at my posts on the Laura Doyle Facebook page, I noticed my own transition. It's a great exercise actually. Wow. Because I started with these stressed out posts that were like begging for help with my husband and they eventually were transitioning to calm and questions about me and my growth and yes. my choices. Yes. And, you know, all of these women over all of these months that um, have commented on my posts or they're all, it, that it's so supportive and non-judgmental and real and, you want them to be your best friends. They are your best friends because they can be honest with that, honest with you without hurting you. Hmm. And they don't care if you're not wearing the right, you know, makeup or clothes. They don't care. They don't care. It's not about that. No. And I always thought, as a side note, I always thought women were mean and vindictive and judgy, Ooh. right? Ooh. Right? Because it feels, and it feels so good now to know that women feel what I feel. And I'm not alone no. in my journey as a woman. No. And it's empowering to know that you can have support within two minutes by going on that Facebook mm. page. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, that if I'm in desperate need of something, there's either a coach call or the Facebook page, or I can get help so fast. So in February, I went out to see my husband in California for the long President's Day weekend, which of course is also Valentine's Day. And I was feeling a little needy because you can't, you're not perfect 24 seven. No, nobody is. No. Yeah. And I, I, I said something, I asked something, I said like something about him leaving or if there was somebody else or it, it wasn't like a blatant accusation. It was just a pathetic like thing. Mm. And his response was, if I wanted to leave you for another woman, I would have. Our problems are our problems. I will never forget that because that was the biggest heart message I have ever heard. Because in that moment, even though I could have freaked out and cried, no, in that moment, I realized I could save my marriage. He doesn't want to leave. He may say he wants to leave, but uh uh-uh, he does not want to leave. And he does not want that other woman. And that he's trying to wrap his head around me changing and where have I been for, you know, 25 years, you know? And so it was a strong, strong sign that it was time. And that was in that moment, I knew that I had to truly let go of the other woman not search anymore and not give that part of my life power. I need to focus on me, how I show up to my husband, how I respond to my husband and how I present myself with my words. So I had this really big win in February. I wear this necklace with two hearts on it. It's beautiful. All the time. He gave it to me. I wear it. And in September, the necklace itself broke and was unfixable. And looking back, I think that was a sign of like, my marriage is in trouble, right? Because I couldn't wear my hearts. And 
my coach in about December was saying, you know, you need to put out a desire. You need to put out a desire. And I'm like, I don't, I, I mean, how do I put out a, something that I want to have without wanting or expecting yes. it to be true? Tricky, right? It's very tricky. And so she, her comment was, can we come up with something that you really want that if it happens, great. If it doesn't, you don't care. I'm like, oh, well, I have this necklace. So I put out that desire. In December, I think I said, oh, I would love a new chain for my hearts. In February, I came home from work one day and he had got me a chain. And in that moment, I could save myself and create a new marriage. (laughs) Not save the old one, but create a marriage that's quiet with respect and um, awareness. So things, so now we're like coming into March and things were progressing. And my husband and I slowly was like two steps forward, one step back. Right. But I was still working hard with Laura Doyle, the coaching calls. I think I rewatched the modules by that point, probably three times. I just kept engaging in the group. And at the end of the April, beginning of May, um, my husband came home for about two, three weeks because um, we had two graduations. My daughter was graduating from graduate school and my son was graduating from college. And it was Mother's Day. It was like all wrapped up. And yeah. my parents my parents were coming. And this is going to be the first time I've seen my parents since COVID. So there was a lot. So, um, and we've had at that point, up until that point, we've had a couple of hard conversations that, you know, probably needed to happen, but everybody was listening. We were both listening to each other. So a couple of mm-hmm. nights before all of this celebrations and my parents coming, it was about 8.30 at night, which I don't know about you, Laura, but that's like past my bedtime. Yeah. Just say, you know, he's like, I really need to talk to you. He's like, if, if we're going to make a go at this, I need to talk to you. And that was the moment. That was when he shared his truth, his story. Um, He shared about the other woman. He shared about the affair. And before this, through all my stooping, yes, I had suspicions, but never, right? Did I know the extent of the truth or the extent of the affair? And let me add that up until that night, there was never confirmation, right? Because I never brought it up to him. Wow. So you could have always told yourself, well, maybe I'm wrong. Exactly. You know, so this was a parade of horrors for you. It was a parade of horrors. But as he told me about the affair and how he felt and why he thinks he did it and his guilt for it, I think what's important for me is that if, if I did push, if I did coerce him, if I did at any point over the last seven, eight months, I would not have shown up the way I did. I, I, there's no way. There, with the amount of work I was putting into me, yeah. I was able to show up dignified and silent oh. that night. And oh. in some ways, I was relieved. I and then, of course, other ways I'm scared. The truth hurts. I get numb. He finished talking. I, I had nothing to say, like I because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know what to do. He, I, I remember him saying, "Do you want me to sleep in the other room?" And I'm like, oh. uh, "No, like no." But did I sleep? No. Right? <laughs> no. No, you're not going to sleep. And I, I woke up really early and I had to go to work the next day. And again, remember, all these people are coming. This is a big celebration weekend. Yeah. So I got up and I just, I remember tapping his foot and I'm like, okay, I'm leaving. Um, I got to go to work. I'll talk to you later. And he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I just, I got to go to work. So I'm in the car and I knew I needed self care. And there was, there was an op- opportunity for a very early morning call coach call. And I knew that I had to not only get on that call, but channel my ultimate desire to have one-on-one coaching. Uh-huh. See. Yeah. I needed 20 minutes of that. Like I needed that 
desperately. So pretty much I got on the call. I made, I was like the first one to raise my hand and I was like, I desperately need coaching. This is happening. And I was like, so that's, and she's like, okay, so I'm going to come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> after, we, after everybody shares their wins. But I got the coaching and what I was able to learn in that moment was to flip all my fears into gratitudes. That basically by looking at that moment that he was able to share with me his truth, that he knew I was a safe place and yes. that he could be honest yes. and open. So I needed to think of this as a moment of being grateful for my husband's honesty and his ability to share with me and to show up to our conversations with that attitude about this. But let me add that what goes through, I would think, any woman's head is the moments where you want to know the logistics of the affair. And my mind went there. All those yucky questions about sex and how they kissed and did he hold hands with her and did he like her kisses better than mine and did he whisper in her ear and was he more romantic? All those questions. And like I wanted to be able to paint this picture in my head of them together and know all the gory details. And yet I kept coming back to the one question. How knowing these things, will they serve me? The answer to that is no. I may think that they will, but again, that's the stories in my head. But they don't serve me and they they don't help me. When I came home that night from work, the first thing I did was I said to him, I just, I want to go take a hot shower. And then I would love to sit down and and have a glass of wine. Hmm. And I came out and I could tell that he was waiting for something. And I said, I love you. Hmm. I am grateful for your honesty and feeling like you can finally share this with me. It's going to take me a little time to process this. That's it. That's all I said. It took me time. My husband was very patient. He, he could see there were days that I was struggling and there are days that I wasn't. And, you know, of course, with the celebrations, I had to work through it all. Um, but I had to really move forward and not hold on to that pain. And that's really hard. Now that they, that truth is out there, it's really, really hard to let go of that pain. Do these questions or doubts still come into my mind sometimes? Yes. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you watch television or you see something in the news. It, but it, it, it's just a little fear. I call her fear girl. I actually keep her in my pocket because when I feel it coming, it's like you just, you just squeeze her. So, you know, I know that I have to, I can choose. I can choose to be scared and have fear or I can choose faith and trust myself to keep going. Mm. And as I process his, his truth, I finally realized and discovered the true definition of being an empowered woman. And that to me is the biggest thing that's come from all this, that I'm being, that I'm able to show up dignified and that, that way it, it brings respect. It brings love. And most of all, it helps me love me. And that jealousy and anger those are just masks for pain, right? They just, the anger and the jealousy are, are the outward of the pain that we're feeling inside. And do I still get hurt? Of course I do, right? Everybody does. But I know how to show up now and how to deal with it. I, and I, I think this was a coach and I think it was in your book, Laura. You said, you are responsible for your own happiness. Your husband can only add to your happiness. And one thing my husband does say to me now all the time is, you just seem happy. Mm. And I am. Mm. And I choose, I choose this, right? Yeah. So we just 
celebrated the actual 25 years. Oh. I had put out a desire to take a vacation. Uh, and we did. And everybody was there. It was, we spent a, a it was an amazing, amazing, amazing vacation. I feel like I'm more courageous now. Like, and having courage is not just being brave, right? It's being vulnerable and being able to exercise compassion for my husband and for my friends and loving my imperfect self. No shame, no guilt. I love me for me. And that kind of makes me, you know, like just smile. Is my marriage perfect? No. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. But it's come so far because I have come so far. And it's a process. And we have, like, I would not trade this process for anything in the entire world, even on those roller coaster rides. So let, let's pause on that for a second. I mean, this was a, a very painful experience. This was a life shattering heartbreak. And you wouldn't trade it. No, no, no. And it's hard. And what I learned is that I can still do at my age hard things, right? <laughs> like we all take the easy way out and and I can do hard things. And in some weird way, I love the hard. Yeah. Because you see the journey's hard, the growth is hard. And as women, I think we're very impatient with ourselves, yeah. right? We sure. want instant. Um, but I like the hard because every day something great comes of that. And when I can look back at yesterday and be like, I did that. I wanted that. I took care of myself. There's something very empowering from that and something that makes you just feel so good inside. And it's really good to feel good inside. Yes. yes and it's it not is. selfish, right? No. 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 Self-control. Yes. Yes. So, um, so and what, how would you describe your marriage now? Like what, what adjectives would you use? I would describe my marriage now as... It's light. We definitely have more fun. There's a lot of respect. We have this saying in the Laura Doyle campus, the wife mirror, the husband mirror, like thing. And what you don't, what I what I learned is that how my energy, like my energy is like my perfume. It just comes off of my body and and how I show up is how he's gonna show up. And there are days that he may be grumpy for things that have nothing to do with me. That's okay. Whatever. If he wanted to share with me, he would. And there's days that I wake up and I'm like, and I'll say it out loud. I am just not feeling it today. Okay. Like that's okay. But there's no more judgment. There's just smiles. And when hard conversations come, because they do, because everybody has, you know, whatever, whatever that may be. But now they come from a place of respect and no one's, I don't get defensive. He doesn't get defensive. There's no reactions anymore. There's like, okay, let's pause. Let's process. How do we do what we need to do? And it's like, we're working together now versus just letting life happen to us. We're doing it together. It's beautiful. How about the physical intimacy? Oh, it's it's back. It's great. It's often. Wow. <laughs> and I will say that, you know, when when you realize that there's another woman, there's always those moments, right? You, you get into physical intimacy and you just question yourself and sure. And that goes away with time. I just think it's you don't don't worry about it. Wow. Great. Uh, well, and that leads to the what's your tip for somebody who's where you were? finding out that her husband wants to separate. There's another woman. He's not physically in the home. What's, where should she start if she wants to create what you have now, which is where it sounds like you're a team and you're able to 
discuss challenges together in a kind of a calm way where there's a lot of respect and there's lightness and fun, passion. I think, I yeah. think you've got to give into the process. It's okay to be impatient. It's okay to have doubt. It's okay to be like, you know, especially if, if you join the Laura Doyle campus, it's okay to say to your coach, what do you mean it's going to take so long? It's okay to say it to her because she understands. But really love the process. And for me, writing down every day my self-fulfilling prophecies my wins of what I what went great for my day and my self cares those filled me that filled me and that is a habit now that will never ever go away for me that's something that I'm going to continue to do because you I don't want to get complacent I don't want to get lazy because the minute you get lazy is the minute it's not a diet it's a lifestyle so don't. You don't want to get complacent. I just want to keep going. And it takes, what, five minutes? It doesn't take a long time. So. It doesn't. And no. it sounds like it's part of being the best Stephanie. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what would you say to Stephanie from before, you know, before the whole breakdown, if you could go back and tell her what you know now? Well, first of all, I don't know if she would listen. I'm being honest because, you know, I think with age comes some wisdom. And I don't, I honestly don't know if she would have said, oh yeah, I'll read that book or, oh yeah, I'm going to do the skills. Oh, what do you mean? I have to be quiet. I really don't know if she would listen. And I think that's an important message that, that women should have. Like, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but at the same time, if you're not ready, then you're not ready. Yeah. And was there a buildup till that horrible day back last year when he said, I need to separate? Yes. Was I paying attention to it? Kind of maybe no. Does it go back years and years? Of course it does. Was I shoving it under the rug, so to speak? Of course I was, but I wasn't ready. I was ready now. And part of the reason I think I was ready now is that I took a chance. And I took a chance by joining a group that I knew nothing about. Yes. And getting on a coach call and having the coach see me that first time. And that, so what I would tell myself 25 years ago is take a chance, Mm -hmm. take a chance. Be brave, be courageous. You certainly have been, you certainly have been. Uh, And your story is incredible, Stephanie. I am so inspired by, uh, you are the accountability queen. (laughs) <laughs> really, uh, I see that. And it's just, I think it's just provides so much hope to any woman who's right in the thick of it, especially to hear you talk so authentically about, yeah, of course you want to know the answers to these questions that maybe aren't going to help you, but you feel like they're going to help you and you, and you want to pursue that. And you just decided not to, like you just were able to find the ability to show up and it was hard. Laura. Yes. Like yes. to not ask or, and to, you know, I'm not, this has not been easy. Right. And this has not been like, what about the other woman? No, I, I couldn't do that. Cause I was scared of the answer. I think in the beginning. Yeah. And then as I started learning the skills and I started working on me and I started seeing the changes I was like, I don't want to know the answer. Don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. No, no. But it's remarkable because and it's, it sounds like you you probably don't even know if she's gone or... No, I know for a fact she's gone. You yeah. know for a fact she's gone. I know gone. for a fact she's gone. Wow. Because he, he, when he was sharing his truth over the next several days after the celebrations and everybody had left, he said, I just want you to know, like, she's... Yeah, completely gone. Yeah, completely and, gone. And you know what? I trust him. Oh. And I, I, I don't look. I don't care to look. I don't need to look. Mm-mm. Yeah. No. Too much good going on at your house. Yeah. That's I see what I see. What's in front of me now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that expression. You know, a wife with the intimacy skills trumps the other woman every day of the week. 
And twice on Sundays. <laughs> twice on Sundays. <laughs> so you're living proof of it. Yeah. You're a wonderful example of it, Stephanie. And uh, it is impressive just how how much focus you brought to this process. And and now you get to enjoy the wonderful benefits of it. And uh, it's not just an inner smile anymore. It's an outer smile that Thank I see you. you wearing. It's beautiful. And congratulations on saving your your marriage. How did this... How has this affected your four kids? So they knew that mom and dad were having problems. We, I would never, ever, ever, first of all, it's not my story to tell. So I would never tell my husband's story. And that's not for me to get. And it's, it's funny that you asked that, Laura, because the other day we were driving and I said to him, it came up and I said, um, you know, if the kids ever found out about the affair, I think our daughters would be very mad at me at their mom because girls are raised. If someone cheats on you, you got to go. That's right. Right. That's right. And we so are. Yeah. We are raised. And that's, that's not what I don't, I think that's a toxic way to look at things because there is accountability on both sides. And that doesn't mean that I want my daughters to be cheated on either. Right. No, of course not. Of yeah. course not. But I, my kids, I will say, that they, because they're adult children, they now, because we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, it is obvious that they see love and they're like, seriously, you guys have to kiss again. Seriously, you guys have to (laughs) talk like that to each other. Like, aren't you too old for that? Like all that stuff that they haven't said in a long time, they're saying, but at the same time, they are happier. I, we see them being happier and that's, that to me, if, if I guess if I had to go backwards then, Laura, for the sake of my children, I wish I was mature enough or wise enough to have learned this sooner, right? But you don't know what you don't know and it's okay. No, you don't. You don't know. It's okay. No one ever taught you skills before. No. No one, yeah. But I'm, I'm now teaching them to my children. I'm now using them with my children. And it's, you know, it definitely helps parenting for sure, especially adult children. Because I show up differently. And in a sense, now my husband shows up differently too with that. Yes, yes. So it's really full circle. Well, and how gratifying to be able to pass those skills on to the next generation. Absolutely. As a, as a role model, right? As a beacon of what's possible for your 25th anniversary. Yeah. Uh, despite some rough spots, here you are still standing together. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been very inspiring. I'm going to have a spring in my step the rest of the day. (laughs) Thank you, Laura. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fix a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. And the advice I find most cringeworthy this week was sent to me by one of my coach trainees. So thanks for sending me this truly terrible advice. This is my grateful shout out to you. Thanks for the love and for being alert for bad marriage advice. The rotten advice that she sent me was in a weekly family magazine. And while I'm sure the writer meant well, I think you'll see why I can't stop cringing when I read this to you. She writes, a husband and wife decide together one Sunday evening that the husband will call around for a life insurance quote during the coming week. The week comes, but the husband doesn't do it. You can then say to your spouse something like, if you don't get the quote by Thursday, I'll take care of it myself. 
but I'm going to feel upset and resentful and that won't be good for our happy marriage. That won't be good for our happy marriage. Yeah, well, she goes on to say that this works best when the marriage is in fact happy and the spouse who is saying it is normally positive and loving and the person it's being said to is mature, caring, and emotionally healthy. So right there, if you don't get a good response, maybe that person wasn't mature and caring and emotionally healthy, right? But of course, as you know, this is not a conversation that's conducive to a happy marriage at all. I know for me in the battle days, if my husband and I had, quote, decided together on Sunday that he would call for a life insurance quote during the coming week, what that actually meant was that I had told him, hey, John, we need life insurance. We should get a quote. And why don't you call around for one? And my husband would say, "Uh uh-huh, to try to end that unpleasant, overbearing conversation quickly. That's what deciding together looked like at my house back then. So when I hear the phrase deciding together, I imagine my husband getting steamrolled right from the beginning, especially when I hear that the husband didn't fall through. Sounds like he was not on board to begin with, or at least not very inspired. I've got a hunch. I've got a hunch that he never agreed in the first place. Whenever my husband can't seem to get something done that I want him to do, it's a pretty good sign that I'm trying to control him. It's a warning light that I'm likely coming from my fear instead of my faith in him. So that's something I can change. I can decide to trust him or maybe even apologize for being controlling in the first place so that he is free to maneuver the way he thinks is best and when the timing is right for him. I can decide to expect the best, not the worst. That is well within my control. Or I could say this cringy has been repelling thing that she suggests here, which is if you don't get the quote by Thursday, I'll take care of it myself, but I'm going to feel upset and resentful and that won't be good for our happy marriage. Wow, I would feel awful telling someone else that if they didn't do what I wanted them to do when I wanted them to do it, I would then decide to get upset and resentful and it would be all their fault. It just makes me shudder to think like that because I would feel like such a victim. I did feel like such a victim. I still remember what that felt like and how stuck I felt when my husband wouldn't respond well, even if I did threaten to be an unpleasant toothache of a person later, which made me an unpleasant toothache of a person anyway. I tried that failed approach many times and it never, ever worked, but it did make me lose my dignity and have an emotional hangover, which I don't miss at all. For that reason, this advice to say, if you don't get the insurance quote by Thursday, I'll take care of it myself, but I'm going to feel upset and resentful that it, and that won't be good for our happy marriage is the very, very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week's podcast is how to be vulnerable in a relationship. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I spend so much time avoiding getting in the shower that I'm always surprised when I do get in there and I realize this is where I want to live always.